Hello, welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm speaking with the amazing Solomon Petrovsky, brilliant therapist specializing in gestalt and also just other kinds of amazing wizardry, for lack of a better word. Uh, Solomon also draws a lot of his foundation from his training in martial arts and his really strong emphasis on self-care. We have a really lovely conversation about what his journey for self-care has been, how it has shaped and affected his life and his clinical experience and his current practice, and also how the two of us have explored that work together as well. It's a really, really good conversation. I think if you are doing any kind of work in any kind of profession, even if it's not Chinese medicine or teaching yoga, I think you're going to get a lot of value out of this conversation today. Without further ado, let's get into it. Hello, soul. Hello, Karina. Hi. <laughs> it's good to see Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Good to see you too. This is great. You're so welcome. Mm. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure to be connecting. Um, for those of you that are listening, I've known Solomon now for almost a couple of years and Solomon was mostly known to me uh, by the Southern School Connection, but I'd never actually had Solomon as a teacher in the counselling subject, but heard amazing things. Mm. And then we finally had a chance to interact right at the tail end when uh, all of us fourth years are just dragging our feet across the finishing line. <laughs> <laughs> just like, oh, my God, am I going to make it? And, yes, yeah, Solomon came in to do, uh, well, a life-changing session for me one day. Essentially, it was like a pep talk and very relaxed but incredibly profound about self-care. Uh, for me, That's that was the essence of that was you're only going to survive or you're only going to really make it with whatever you do. It doesn't even have to be business-oriented if you take care of yourself. And I think it might have only been, I don't know, a couple of sentences in, tired little old me was kind of slumped down in my chair and then I just sort of sat up and went, I'm listening. <laughs> Whatever this person has to share, I am on. I am, here is my sponge, I am ready. Yes. I'm ready to mop this up. Yeah. It was a great class. It was, it was a great class. Yeah. Yes, yes. And well, uh, what yeah. were some of the things that stood out for you? Well, one of the things that stood out for me first was how you talked about the way that you design your professional schedule. Um, right. As in you have figured out for you when the best times of the day are for you to do your self-care and when the best times of the day are for you to see clients. Mm. And it was a huge light bulb moment for me because I thought, you can do that? You're allowed to decide? You're allowed to choose your own hours? You're what? allowed to choose your own hours? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Particularly how long you shared you give yourself every morning. That it's, it's not that you just give yourself a little hour to check in and have a stretch or go for a run. It's a considerable length of time. Yeah. And then when all of that is done, then you are ready to hold that space with others. Yeah, so on average about three hours every morning, I, I dedicate to self-care. And that can be anything from uh, moving my body, uh, refreshing my mind, sitting still, being active, whatever I feel like I need on, on, on that given day. Um, and we were chatting about this uh, not long ago, but it's 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 movement with intention. So a lot of us do exercise, but we forget to put the intention behind it. So the self-care behind it is to remind ourselves why we're doing it, is to remind ourselves that we're worth taking care of, we're worth looking after. We've only got the, the physical health part of it that we relate to, but the psychological part of it, the... The, um, the emotional 
side of it is the part that not a lot of us connect to when we're out there doing our morning walk or doing our morning stretch is that, you know, talk to yourself. Let yourself know that you're worth it. Let yourself know that if you're out there giving to others, that that's time for you. That's time for for you to give to yourself. And it and it makes a considerable difference. It really does. Because what you're doing is you're beginning a dialogue with yourself and you're adding movement to it. You're adding body language to it. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's not just your mind speaking to your mind, but it's now your body speaking to your mind, which in essence is body language, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the way your body speaks to your mind is is really the only way in which we can communicate with ourselves, how our mind listens to what our body does. Mm. And then you attach that with conscious thought and it's, yeah, um, it's a, it's a beautiful coming together and you can, you can feel better really quick doing that. I get the impression that you didn't, that that wasn't necessarily what you did from the get go when you started your career, or maybe oh, no. it was. No. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> no 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 no. I had to I had to learn the hard way. Um, certainly, uh, I gave to others way more than I gave to myself. Um, I started out on this path because I wanted to avoid myself. That's why I wanted to be a helper. Mm. I thought that, I thought that if I could help others it would somehow fix what was going on with me and that's it. So I would just give and give and give and give and give and put almost nothing in return back the other way. And, you know, as you know, that's very finite. That has, that has a shelf life, a very short one, a very short one. Once that cup is empty, it's just dust in there. It's yeah. dust. And it's not, that's not only professionally, that's personally as well. You know, we give to our families or we give to our partners or we give to our friends. You know, we give to charities, we give to communities, we give to sporting clubs and we give all this stuff. But, you know, looking at the intention of it as to why we're giving it, you know, and oftentimes it's because we, we don't feel like we're enough to give to ourselves. Yeah. I, yeah. I bel- believe that was a, one of the first questions you asked me when we started uh-huh. working together. And I was a bit of a teary mess just mm-hmm. trying to explain to you so that you would hear my plight of how much I'd been giving to everyone <laughs> and how there was nothing left to give. Mm-hmm. And it was probably the first time that somebody had sat in that space with me and not not kind of indulged me talking through all the detail, but simply just stopped me in my tracks gently and said, why all the giving? What? Karina, why all the giving? I was quite stumped. <laughs> yeah. And it's probably, it's been a year and a half of me untangling the, the, the root underneath that. And I think that's a really common thing, what you just said before maybe consciously or unconsciously, a lot of us are attracted to the healing arts and the helping arts because there is something that we are trying to heal, but we don't really know how to do it for us. We're trying to do it by proxy. Absolutely. Yeah. Something dawned on me a while ago and it was the day I became effective was the day I stopped trying to help people. Okay. Now that sounds really weird for a practitioner to say because isn't our job to help others? So it's a really weird statement. But the day I stopped trying to help others was the day I became effective at my job. Mm. Because what it opened up trying? my idea. Well, the trying was the fixing the trying to help, the coming up with solutions, doing all the work for the other person. In fact, it made the other person irrelevant, really, in the room. It was me doing it all. And that has a whole bunch of negative effects. First and foremost, 
you're excluding the client from being involved in the process. They're coming there to learn how to do it themselves. Yeah. They're actually not coming there for me to tell them what to do, even though that's what it might look like. That's the appearance. Mm -hmm. You're the expert. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. But generally when we tell someone what to do in life, they do the opposite anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or they're like, don't tell me what to do. Yeah. I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, how did Sensei put it? We're, we're, we're creatures of resistance. Mm. Yeah. So when, when I learned that lesson and I just learned how to sit back and hold space, and maybe this is something, you know, you can talk about as well in your experience of this, but that, that ability to just sit back, hold space, not get involved, really listen to myself and how much of me is in the room mm. and just work on bringing that back, work on bringing that back and back and back and back and back. The more I bring that back, the more that allows the person to step forward. It's very true. That's space. It's holding space. You want that person to come forward. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not there. Actually, it means that I'm more there. I'm just not there with all my preconceived ideas of how I think I should help you. Yeah. I talk a lot in yin yoga about the importance of silence. Mm. And I think that this is extremely relevant. And I can say from experience of being in that with you when there mm. are exquisitely held silences where it's true, you are impeccably present, but you're not handing it to me. You give me this space so that I can actually get somewhere new myself with support. Mm. And it's powerful. It's really powerful. Yeah, it's powerful. When you allow enough silence, it, it starts to amplify. Mm doesn't it? It starts to amplify yeah. the thoughts in your head. And was that the thing that shifted? You just said before that the day that you stopped trying to help, there mm -hmm. was a significant shift. There was more effectiveness. Is that what you did? You went, I'm actually just going to pull myself right back in today in this session and just see what happens. It was, it was actually my sensei that offered me that amazing bit of advice and how do I put this in the most succinct way possible when he opened up my eye my, my eyes to the idea that there is no separation between me and the person in front of me that we are in fact one and the same there is no one else mm -hmm. that that person is just a reflection of me sitting in front of me. So the better I can control and hold myself in that space, the more taken care of I can be, mm. the more looked after I am, the less I'm gonna wanna do it for that person because it's all a projection out. So I just went to work. I just went to work on myself. You know, four, five nights a week on the mats, you know, pulling my insides, pulling my insides out, putting it all on the table, having a look at it. And the more and more I did that, the less of that that came into the room and the more space there was for the person that I was sitting in front of. Yeah. Yeah, and just, for those listening, just to fill in the blank of what does that mean on the mat and pulling my insides out? You're talking about your martial arts practice. I am. I apologize. Yes. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I apologize. Yes. My martial arts. Just in practice, case that so. sounded a little, uh, um, a little surgical. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I've been, I've been practicing martial arts for about, for about well, going on 12 years now. And you know, the first couple, the first five, maybe, I, mean, I, I really didn't know what I was doing or what I was being told, but I just kept turning up. 
And the more I kept training, the more I realized that actually martial arts is just a study of life. It's a study of how two people move and understand each other. And then I started to realize, well, it's actually how you move and understand yourself with the stimulus of training partner. That person is actually you. And so the more and more and more I got involved in understanding that that person training with me is actually just teaching me about me. They are there solely for my training so I can learn about myself. They're offering me their body so I can learn about myself. There is no separation. Oh, we can get into that, like the, the trust involved in, 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 in that sort of practice and the application of pain as well as a teacher and sitting in discomfort, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk mm. about later on. Oh, my goodness, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's really important. Yeah, but, but once Sensei started introducing me to that concept of there actually isn't anybody else, so who are you really trying to help? And what a huge parallel between Amazing. that work you do on the mat and the work that happens with clients. No different. No difference. No yeah. different. Actually, today I call it my dojo because there is no difference between what I do on the mats and what I do in the consulting space. It's, it's two people offering up emotional space to learn about themselves. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. It's very, very, very yeah. cool. And so when I started discovering that as a practitioner, that actually there is only just m me in the room. And, and the more I can keep that centered, controlled, calm, reserved, but present, the results were, were, incredible crazy instantaneous and did something happen to your own energy levels at that time as well did you know like obviously as someone else who's also come from a very chronic program of giving over giving and not quite knowing where the levels are between me bleeding out which was my term mm -hmm. and um how to hold those reserves steady for self and then let, let the little bit of spillover be what I share if I want to. Mm -hmm. It's very draining to be giving a lot and to give that way in a, in a clinician role, to be sort of overstepping to try and really help someone get there with you yes. there, pushing them up the hill can be very exhausting. So it I is. bet that that just changed your own energetic state. Absolutely. And even just holding space in itself requires a lot of energy, just in a different way, rather than, rather than everything that I used to give and all the talking that I did and all the advice I used to give. Now it's in the holding. It's in the mm -hmm. keeping quiet. It's in the listening. It's in the timed question. It's in the picking the moment where you know, the air changes in the room or there's a sudden change in someone's colour. And catching it in that moment and asking, oh, what just happened then? And that, that, that's it. Yeah. That's what sometimes the person being asked doesn't even realise there's been a subtle shift. No. I think that's one of the most profound things about working with you is that because you are so present, you can, that these micro changes in expression or a, a change in color, you are there seeing it happen. And then you can help, help me or whoever it is that you're working with go in there and not just jump over it. Yeah. Which can be yeah. a tendency. Absolutely. Or do a complete 90 degree. <laughs> He'll spin away from it and run. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there are some clients that just, they're not ready for that type of inquiry. And so there are different types of inquiry that you can get from 
you know, keeping yourself well held. <clears throat> and there's a there's a mantra that I keep, and it's I always err on the side of never being quite sure what I'm being told. Because as humans, we we're desperate to know, we're desperate to know. I mean, even even going through this pandemic, the 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 longevity of not really knowing when and how and for how long you can see what it does it's it's uh grueling yeah it's really painful yeah and so a lot of my training is really about staying in the discomfort my own discomfort i've never really been sure what i'm being told mm. and when i can do that it prompts me to keep inquiring. So I never let my own bias get in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me more. What do you mean when you say that? Mm -hmm. So when you say this word, I know what it means for me. Explain what it means for you. Yeah. Yeah. What just happened then? I'm curious to know. Or um, what is it that you want me to hear? Mm -hmm. Instead of making an assumption. Instead of making an assumption. Mm. Let them tell you because it's all about them clarifying it for themselves. There, there's an old saying, um, I'm, I'm the most important therapeutic tool in the room, so much so that I can't afford to be there. And so for all your listeners out there, you probably <laughs> would have heard me say that in class, so much so that I can't afford to be there. If I'm there, I'm jumping in with all my preconceptions and and understanding. And so therefore I'm starting to assume, I know what you're talking about. You say mm. depression, I know what depression means and I'm off, I'm, I'm, I'm off to the races. Yeah, yeah. But what do you feel in, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, please, yeah. please, please. I was gonna say, what do you feel happen in your body when the part of you that's got your own biases, cause we all have them, we're all in our own supposed ego self with mm. our own filters and whatnot. What do you feel in your body when you sense that the Solomon biases are coming forward? Uh, and then how do you, you must have a pretty good way of noticing that and then going, actually, I, I can't, um, I can't run with that. Cause that's not, that's not necessarily what's going on here. What mm. do you feel happen in your body? That feeling of, oh, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Have you ever had a conversation with someone where they know what you mean and so then they start talking about <laughs> what they think they know what you mean? Does that ever make sense? Yeah. Or, um, or what happened to them when what that happened, happened to them? Yeah. I know. Happened this happened to them. happened to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I wouldn't say it like that in the session, but I would, that, that feeling or that need to jump in with, oh, yes, I understand. Just that, just that statement, I understand. You may as well say, oh, that happened to me. Let me tell you. Mm. It's the same thing. Yeah. So that, that's a feeling of, of, of you know, it's, it's a feeling of obviously you want to connect with that person. Yeah. So it's quite uncomfortable to pull that back and to hold that in. Because if you do do that uh, from experience, if I've been in a very vulnerable situation and mm. started to share something with someone and they've done that, gone, oh, yeah, I know that. Me, this thing, this time, boom, mm. I shrink away. I, yeah. I will pull back and go, oh, I've just been steamrolled by someone's good intentions that really wanted to connect, but that was handled poorly. I've now retreated. I've shut it's down a bit. beautiful point. It's a beautiful point. That, that shrinking away interests me. And, you know, and in our work, what are, we, what are we trying to do? Stay with the feeling. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, what's the opposite of shrinking? Expanding. Expanding. You know, I want to mm. expand my clients. I want them to. I want them to expand their repertoire. I want them to expand their words. You know, I want them to tell me exactly what it is that's going on for them. It doesn't matter if it takes a whole hour. Yeah. Every single one of my clients knows 
Karina. They all know. It's just a matter of how many blocks they've got in front of them, but they all know. Yeah. And it's and it's okay if I can just sit with that not knowing with them and just hold them there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and inquire and ask and just get them to find their own words. They'll take those words with them and they'll own them forever. And sure, there's a time where you've got to pick your balance of when it becomes too uncomfortable. And there's always time for sharing. There's always times for me to share something of my own. But I only do it when I'm asked. Mm. Yeah. And even then I might say, I'm wondering what's important about you knowing that about me. Mm. And they might say something like, well, well, I don't know anything about your soul and, and uh, this kind of feels really disingenuous. I, I feel like it's just me giving, 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 giving. And so when, when that happens, there's absolutely room for sharing. And I've, and I've done that with you. I've done that with others. No problem. Mm -hmm. But you as the client need to invite me in. I yeah. will not come in of my own accord. Because it does two things. Like you said before, it shrinks the client. Yeah. They get nothing from it. And I get really, really, really tired. There's no winner. Mm. I do too much. I go home. I'm exhausted. I've got nothing left for the people that I love. And the client goes home and they feel, they feel unheard. Yeah. And gosh that could just happen that could just happen so easily and it does and, and not just for people that are working um in a sort of talking therapy role this is for everybody that has clients right so all the acupuncturists all the yoga teachers everybody mm -hmm. that might be listening all the modalities there's something that you said before that i'd love to speak to which was about how everybody knows everybody Everybody can get to those places of clarity in themselves. They've got all the stuff in them, but there is something really, really valuable about having someone hold that space to help you move through that to get there. Because I think you and I were talking about this recently. We've developed, I know for myself, I have developed really, really clever diversions. <laughs> so as soon as that moment of discomfort comes, I think I described it to you like Maxwell Smart and all the doors shutting, clank, 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 clank. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. before I even know it, before I even know that I have pivoted off away from a tender spot, it's sort of happened neurologically and I, I'm unaware that it's even occurred because uh -huh. I've created such clever survival mechanisms to avoid my pain. We all mm -hmm. do that. And Absolutely. Yeah, one, of the, one of the things that I've really gained from this work is the space holding and the, the, the gentle coaxing back to that tender spot so that I can even one, just know it's there and two, unwrap it a little bit. Does, I don't have to unwrap it all the way because doors have shut, yeah. <laughs> but at least it's there and the room is safe and I know that nothing's going to happen. Yes. Well, actually, I don't know that nothing's going to happen because there are things that go off in your body that make you feel like you're under threat, even though it's just two people sitting in gorgeous chairs in a quiet <laughs> space, <laughs> relaxing. Shoes off sometimes. Shoes off most times. <laughs> <laughs> it's comfortable. Um, and, and as an extra to that, a conversation I have with a lot of people that work in the psychological field uh, that, that I'm curious about is the way that the nervous system does that seems to me to be very separate from your rational mind where you there is a trauma program or there's a survival program that just goes off because it's learnt to do that. Mm -hmm. But you can clearly say to yourself, there's no reason for me to be 
breathing short. There's no reason for my throat to go all red. There's no reason for me to be breaking out into a sweat. I'm in a safe room, but my nervous system thinks otherwise. Yeah. And One your of nervous the, system. Yeah. Your nervous yeah. system doesn't work off logic either. Not at all. That's that comes back to self-care and what we spoke about before about body language. Mm. Actually, it's your body that speaks to your nervous system. And yeah. so, and so through that continuous self-care, we can actually build up you know, a system that can run alongside it. Mm. And they work together. But I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, that, it's good. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. For acupuncture or even for yin yoga, which is a kind of quiet space where things definitely bubble up for people, sometimes people have big emotional expressions in a class or in a practice. I'm really curious as a clinician to help support that or um, help patients mm. find their own way through the, it's almost like blackberries yes. <laughs> through the thorns to find a clearing where it doesn't have to feel so dangerous. Yeah. But I, it feels, I'm, I'm very interested in that kind of work, but yeah, it's, it's very tough terrain. It is. I mean, I just did it 15 seconds ago. That's how tough it is to rain. Yeah? Mm. I spoke over the top of you. So we've been talking about holding space and being quiet. So that's how difficult it is sometimes when those systems want to kick in, they kick in. And I spoke over the top of you with my own I understanding. Like it. <laughs> yeah. It was fine. Yeah. But it's beautiful for your listeners to watch because they're going to see that and go, oh, hang on. So I just spoke over the top. He was just talking about being quiet. Yeah. It's, it's a tricky game. It's a really tricky game. And for the practitioners out there, it's, you're not always going to get it. But have the courage to study it afterwards. Mm. Something that you shared once about this uh, kind of rewriting the old programs or mm -hmm. un unwiring them to wire a new one, because I was getting quite frustrated. It's like, how do, how do I heal these things? Does trauma actually ever get healed? There's so yes. much in. There's so much being said at this at the moment about being very very sensitive to trauma mm -hmm. almost a little bit if I may say a bit let's walk on eggshells around the trauma because we want everyone to feel safe and not get triggered mm -hmm. but what I my understanding is that to a certain degree it sort of needs to be triggered so that you can move through it in a new way and I don't want to I don't want to simplify that and make it sound like that's really easy because it's not easy but that the old um, emotion that's woven around an event or a memory may stay contained that way forever if it's, if it's never revisited and, and there's a new way that we can move through it. Yeah. Yeah, you have to do the work. You have to bring the feeling up. You have to bring up the thing that's created the life that you currently have that you're trying to change. You have to bring up that thing. There's no, there's no, there's no walking around it. Mm. And the only way over it is through it, is by bringing it up and showing the person a different, a different way through relationship that that can be handled you know, with, with trust and openness and listening and, and love, not fear. You asked me a question. Do you remember what that question was? Just yeah. now or in the past? In the past, around this very, around this very topic of, of trauma and, you know, what, mm. what, what, are, what we are we doing? doing? What are we doing? <laughs> what, what is this? What the hell are we doing? Can, yeah. can, can you explain this to me? Do you remember asking me that? I do. I was frustrated because I like yeah. systems and I want to know What's the plan here? What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> how, how do I fix this? And give me the timeline. Come on. Yeah. Do you remember what the answer was? We're doing it. We're currently doing it. Something along those lines. Yeah. Well, we're doing it right now. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're having a response to something. And I'm giving you a different experience of that response to which you're used to in your life. That's my primary role is to give you a different experience to what you're used to in your times of trauma or in your times when those things come up. And that's why I can't be too much there when the, that comes up for you. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll give you the same experience that your father gave you or your mother gave you or your siblings gave you, just full of reaction, full of my own trauma. Like we spoke before, yeah. if I can just sit back on that and just let you have your space, yeah, and stay empathic. And empathic isn't feeling what you're feeling. Empathic for me, yeah, is allowing you to feel what you're feeling in its fullest expression. And that comes from my wanting to understand fully what you're going through. And so in that moment, which is a moment I won't, I won't forget for a while. It was quite powerful. Something dawned, something clicked for you. And you're like, oh yeah, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, we'd just been doing it for like the last half an hour. And we weren't even face to face, we were on a telephone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Needed versus repeated. That cycle of needed versus repeated. My job is to listen really carefully to what it is that you need. And I'll start to pick up on that by observing what it is that you repeat. And you will bring that into the room, into the chair, into your relationship with me. And then my secondary role is not to repeat it back with you. It's just to remain neutral, empathic. And like I said before, err on the side of never really being sure what it is that you're telling me. Mm. Yeah. And just, just keep leaning in, keep inquiring, keep asking. The most commonly asked question to me is, Sol, do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Do you know what my answer back? Do you, you know what my answer back is, right? I know what your answer is. It's <laughs> no, I don't know what you mean. Tell me what you mean. Yeah, and when okay. you know, yeah, and when you know what you mean, I'll know what you mean. Mm. Yeah, and it's quite a filler out, sentence. We people have that as a filler sentence all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. But that's yeah. that subconscious. That's that thing. That that's those little triggers you spoke about. Mm -hmm. That's the little getaways. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? No, it's almost I don't like saying, know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like saying, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Well, okay. It took you 0.1 of a second to tell me that you didn't know. So how do you know that you don't know? Now that one, that question there has people staring and wondering whether they should jump out the window. Yeah. <laughs> has anyone ever tried? Has they've looked. Run out the door? Oh, they've looked. Yeah. And, and, and but it's a, a lovely, strategy. it's a lovely, it's a lovely moment to have a little bit of lightness as well. It's like, it's looking pretty tempting, isn't it? The old, <laughs> uh, the old swan dive, yeah, the old swan dive into the car park. No, yeah. no sorry, you've got no idea. I feel I'm sweating. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Yeah. And with your experience of of trauma and mm. holding space for people with the traumas that come up, that lightning fast reaction of the nervous system, it takes nothing for it to. It's to, it's like a gun going off. It's so quick. Yeah. And I know that this is probably not something that you can standardize or say, here's the treatment protocol for gently 
coming down from that chain reaction, that shotgun going off. I think the thing for me that I'm really interested in both personally and the things that I see come up for my clients is when that, when that chain reaction goes off and the nervous system goes, yeah. and all of the physiological responses come from that, Time after time, if that happens in a therapeutic relationship where the space is being held quietly but with razor-sharp presence, Mm -hmm. do you see that changing in terms of intensity or frequency or duration, those trauma responses? When I say to you, what are we doing? Does trauma ever actually get healed? That was another question I had was, does trauma actually ever get healed? When those things come up, how do you, are you bypassing it or are you learning to divert it quickly? Have you got a, at least just kind of, I'm just kind of speaking freely now because sure. you've got things that you use for yourself. When that comes up, is it a matter of squashing it down and, and doing the 90 degree turn <sighs> or soothing it until it, Calms. Uh, you need to have a relationship with it. You need to have a relationship with it, Karina. Mm. Trauma is not something that we get rid of. It's it's life defining. So. <laughs> God damn it! My pals, <laughs> my buddies. Well, yeah. Well, they're life. Sh- uh, they're they're life shapers. Trauma is a life shaper. Trauma creates a lot of people's identity. For most of us, we're more shaped by our traumas than we are by our victories. You know, we're threat-based creatures, so we're we're very much shaped by the experiences and most times the traumas that we experience. And we're, we're, we're just adaptations of that. And so we're not about burying that person because it's burying a part of us. And that that can actually induce more shame. Mm. So we're already ashamed enough that we have this trauma. And then if we try and squash it, it just adds double shame. And no one wants double shame. Single shame is enough. Yeah, the squashing to me. Squashing feels like it can happen as quickly as the nervous system program goes off. Oh, yeah. So it's like rises up, squash. And for most people, they don't even know that they're doing it. Rise up, squash. Right. Yeah. And I watch it all the time in sessions. Rise up, squash. You know, the neck goes bright red right until under the chin and the face is just beautiful glow. Not a tinge. Mm. So in essence, with things we were saying before, when someone can hold that space for you, when you, when the, when the nervous system goes off, that's potentially and probably where the magic is to start creating that relationship with it. And maybe that's what I was really meaning when I said, what are we doing? Because I feel like I can't catch it in time to even start to look at it calmly because I'm not in a calm state. Uh And then that feeling of discomfort when you are (laughs) invited to stay with it. Oh my gosh. It's, it's unbearable at times. It is unbearable. Absolutely. And there will be a time and for all your practitioners out there where your client will come for you. They will rattle the cage. They will get frustrated. They will get angry. They will blame you for something. That's the moment. Mm. That's the moment as a practitioner. You have got to stay there. That's not the time for you to engage your trauma and feel triggered and feel hard done by. Mm. You know, in the in the relational work, that is the moment. That's the healing moment. Yeah. And that person is really, really vulnerable. Yeah. And as you experience the frustration, but it can come across in many different ways. 
and there's almost like a rattling of the cage to test whether or not you're going to leave just like that person did just like that person did are you going to do what they did are you going to fuck off and leave me like that person did come on yeah what are you going to do hey prefer jokes (laughs) (laughs) it's not the moment to refer (laughs) Uh, do no harm Uh, (laughs) so i think we've come to the point in our work where i don't feel like i can no so that that, that's That's not not. the time it's not the time Now, I know not, not all of your listeners are going to be counsellors or whatnot. And so this is not about doing deep therapeutic work with your clients. It's about the moment. Mm. It's about the moment when your, your client really looks for you to give them a different experience. For them, for them it's very unconscious or subconscious, a playing out of a pattern, which we've been, you know, working towards, working towards, working towards, we're getting closer and closer and closer and then bam. Mm. For the Chinese med prakis, I think that moment is common because not always, but a lot of the time people come to you as a last resort. Mm. They've gone through many of the more well-known um, Western ports of call first Correct. and yes. still haven't been able to find someone that can validate their experience and not do what I call medical gaslighting. Oh, your mm. blood tests are all fine. Why do I feel so awful? Mm. And there's that, it's like this tiny little bit of, you know, like in the never ending story. I don't know if you know that film well, the first one and the Empress at the very end, she's holding this tiny little glowing grain of sand. Like this is my last little bit of, hope that someone can help me. Mm. Are you the one that can help me? And that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also exciting depending on where you sit. You can be that person. Yeah. So long as you don't get involved. Mm. The relationship is so important because the relationship has caused the trauma. So therefore the relationship is the healing. Mm -hmm. The practice of counseling, the practice of of Chinese medicine is is only a small part. It's actually the relationship. That's why they call it the healing relationship. But most practitioners, when they start out, they go, they go ask backwards, they go modality relationship. Here, let me put a thousand needles in you. Let me do this. Let me do that. But I'm not going to ask you about who you are, where you come from, and what your story is. And they realize why they've got such high turnover. And then in 12 months, they they give up. Two prong. They don't have a good enough relationship with themselves to hold that space, deal with their own trauma. And so they're not going to do it for their clients. And so you can be the best practitioner in the world. You can know meridian points inside out and upside down. You can throw darts at the meridian points. You're so good at it with your eyes closed. (laughs) You can throw darts at your clients and hit the meridian points if you want. (laughs) No, don't do that. Don't do that. It was a joke. It was a joke. Disclaimer. It was a martial arts. (laughs) (laughs) Blow darts. But actually it's, it's, it's the rapport. And, and to everyone out there, if you think about the people that have made a real big difference in your life, practitioners or not, yeah, was it their modality or was it how they made you feel? Mm-hmm. How they made you feel. Because <laughs> no one's going to remember fuck all <laughs> about what you say, but they'll remember how you make them feel because that's where we hold everything. That's the trauma. That's where everything is. It's so go, true. Go relationship first. Modality second. And the number one relationship is the one you have with yourself. That's where all the answers are for you and your clients. And if you want, 
for the business owners out there, the practitioners out there, if you want a sustainable clinic that can look after you, and I've said this to you before, they can look after your family, where you can have a healthy waiting list, people lining up around the corner wanting to see you because you've got that secret. And that secret is that you know yourself well enough that you can allow your clients the space to do the same. Karina, self-care is two-pronged. One is doing all the nice things, the three hours I do every morning. But the second one is practice. Yeah. It doesn't matter what practice it is. Find somewhere safe where you can go and practice and elicit the trauma and the discomfort within you and train from there because that's your starting point. The person you are when you're caught on the hop, the person you are when you're caught out and the lights come on and you're the deer in the headlights, that's who's really steering the ship. That's who's really dictating how your life is going. That's 90%. That's 90% of how we decide how our day is going to go is that person. Now, if we don't find a way to elicit that as practitioners in our own lives, what hope in hell are we going to have of guiding our clients through it? So find your practice, the place that will elicit your own discomfort. And for me, nothing elicited my discomfort like martial arts, nothing. Like the, the feedback is instantaneous. Nothing elicits that information, like being in so much pain where, you know, you can't breathe, you, 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 your chest is being squashed and you've just got to find a way to be okay from there. And, and Sensei's a master at it. He would pick you in your most vulnerable moments. Right when you're on the edge and he'll grab you by the shirt and he'll throw you out in the middle and he'll go, right, Solomon, explain. Now, consciously, he doesn't know what reaction, I don't even know what reaction, I'm going through something. And he cares about me. And that sounds harsh, doesn't it? But he cares about me enough to throw me into the middle of 30 people and to get me to explain what's going on for me in my most uncomfortable moments. And there's nothing out there that I found that hit that mark. Because mm -hmm. I had a truckload of trauma I had to get through. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that hit that mark. So what that taught me was, and what Sensei showed me was how to bring the trauma up, train with it from there. When you know what you're doing, you throw a second person in, a third person, a fourth person, weapons, this, that, do it standing on your head. Now do it with one leg. Now do it with one arm. Now do it with your eyes closed. Yeah. Now do it with your eyes closed and both hands tied behind your back and hopping on one leg like a kangaroo. <laughs> and so you just keep finding the position where you don't know what you're doing. And his greatest gift to me was find the place where you don't know what you're doing and be comfortable there. That's good. It's like, you know, you know, the whole uh, uh, life starts outside your comfort zone type of thing. Mm -hmm. That's where change is as well. That's where growth is. But we don't want to venture there because it's hard. Yes, yeah, it's scary. painful and it's scary. But that's what your clients are coming to try and discover. Now, you've got to find a way to do that. And if you can do that, find that practice, what we call voluntary discomfort. Go and volunteer your time somewhere to get uncomfortable because that's your driver. When you find it, then apply your self-care practice. Go be kind yeah. to yourself. Go get that ice cream. Go watch that movie, you know. Um, go to the driving range, which is my new self-care hobby. You know, go, go right. do your things. Yeah. So the, the practice is to find the wound and then the self-care is to tend. To oh. it. There's such an irony in there too, because it's so uncomfortable trying to avoid your discomfort. There's so much discomfort trying to avoid the painful <laughs> tender spot. Yes. And 
it's like you are there's you cannot escape yourself it's like you're trying to get away from yourself at all times but you can't escape yourself because you're with yourself all the time yeah. and, and that's, so it, yeah. yeah and that's <laughs> addiction isn't picture. it that's where addiction mm. is born from when you just can't escape mm. yourself and it's so painful we go to synthetics we synthetically remove ourselves from our lives that, that's it's not, like it would just be easier to touch the tender spot yeah. like you're doing you'd be putting up such a fight trying to avoid yeah. avoid feeling the jumper that's on your body yeah why not just feel the jumper that's on your body yeah. because breakthroughs come from that in my experience but, but for a lot of us we don't even know at that point we don't even know we're wearing the jumper we don't we even don't know. know and 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 that's where that's where you know you don't tell a depressed person to just get over it just take the jumper off uh -uh. yeah because at that point they don't know that they're wearing the jumper and it's just that that dance is going on all around them. It's so painful to be where they are, but they don't know how to do anything else. So they keep doing what they know, even though what they know is mm. killing them. And you say, just don't do that. Right. <laughs> Good one. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I bet, I bet you never heard that before. Yeah. yeah. Just relax. Oh, yeah. Thank yeah. You. Just relax. Oh, <laughs> just let Genius. it go. Genius. But when you've been doing it for 15 years, how do you let that go? And for me personally, finding a really good teacher is how I finally learned to let that go. Mm. Yeah. How did I make that choice? Well, I could see the way my life was going for me. My practice was burning me out. My relationships were burning me out. I was, I was miserable, absolutely miserable. And, and for a lot of us, we won't change until the pain, or until the suffering of staying the same is less than the pain of change. It doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be like that. But that's how we're, that's how we're conditioned as people. But you can start today. And what I love about this too, Karina, it's this is not just for practitioners. This is for everyone. You want to improve your marriage? Everyone. <laughs> you want to improve your relationships? You want to improve your friendships? Understand that all of those people are just reflections of you. They don't exist other than inside your mind and who you think they are to you. Mm -hmm. When you change, they change. And we expect them to change to make us feel better about ourselves or whatever the situation, but actually yeah. they only exist inside who you think they are in your life and what role you think they play and what personality you think they have and how you think they treat you and how you think they make you feel. But that all comes from you. Yeah. That's all perception. It's all perception. So if you work on your perception, immediately the people around you change. Yeah, this is a way to navigate life. This mm. is not this is not a business coaching tip. This is how <laughs> this is about evolution and having. <laughs> having a, a, your, a better quality of life and relationship yeah. with the world in which you're in, which includes all the people that are in your world. Absolutely. And when you have a better relationship with yourself, mm. naturally you're going to have better relationships around you. Now that in itself is uncomfortable because you might have to say goodbye to old ones. Not because, not because you want them to go away, but that, that they, they just won't be able to be around this new version of you. It'll be too triggering for them. Mm. 
better quality of friendships, better quality of relationship. You'll start to see your partner in a different way because you're seeing yourself in a bit in a, in a different way. And in practice, it changed everything for me. Mm. The study of myself changed everything in my practice. Now, how can that be? Because I, aren't I there to study others? But when you understand there is no separation, as we often talk about, mm. the, the, it's just the study of the self. And that yeah. never ends and never ends. The more I studied myself, the busier my business got, the more clients that came to see me. And it just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew to the point now where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working with people every corner of the globe, you know. Six, seven years ago, I had a little, little, little tiny practice in, in Northcote. Wouldn't even call it a practice, a hobby. <laughs> it was me telling people what to do all day and then going home. but then the people stop coming. And then you start to worry about the bills and you start to worry about money. And that makes you try even, it makes you try even harder and give more because that's what you think people want. Oh. It's, a, it's a story I've heard, I've experienced and I've heard a lot with practitioners. Yeah. But when you get down to actually, it's just about you. Study yourself, study yourself well, and study yourself often. Mm. It completely changed yes. my life, yeah. changed my business. And now I have, and now I have a business that, that works with people worldwide. I've never done a day's marketing in my life, but the phone just keeps ringing. And how does that work? Solar power. Solar power. <laughs> <laughs> the word of mouth, right? People tell people. And now I have a business that sustains me. It looks after me, just like I look after the business. We're one and the same. Mm. And when well, you, you are the business, yes, right? Yeah. We are our businesses. We are our businesses. No we are not separate there either. Yeah. Oh, your business is a very, very close, uh, maybe one of the closest representations of who you are. So I often hear, don't take your work home with you. Well, actually, you are your business. So that's kind of unavoidable. How do you want to take your work home with you is the better question. How do you want to take it home with you? Mm. Yeah. When I leave practice, I feel more energized than when I start. It I takes can hear a people lot. raising eyebrows at that going, uh, how? How? <laughs> well, you know, we've spoken about it, the solar power yeah. effect, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's not to say that it, it's not exhausting work because listening all day and being laser focused is, is really tiring. It really is. But that's a separate thing. I feel so energized at the end. It's because I start with an overflowing cup, like we said. Yeah. So I don't need my clients to do or to give or to fix anything for me. It's just, it overflows. And so the clients en end up, for lack of a better analogy, drinking from the overflow. Yeah? And then you see their energy rise. And then that creates energy in the room. And so it, rather than it being like a, a soul-sucking experiment, yeah? It's a solar powered ex experiment. <laughs> and it's funny because I often get asked, like, how do you keep the energy so high? That's the secret. I start with a really, really full cup. 
and then the energy just fades off itself. And the full cup is the self-care. The full cup is the self-care. Yeah. Every day. Every day. <laughs> uh, it, was, it, was it James Clear, Atomic Habits? Like um, a day missed will hurt you 10 times more than a successful day will help. Yeah. Because what are you saying when you miss a day? What are you saying to yourself when you when you skip? What are you really saying? I don't saying? matter. I don't matter. I don't matter. I don't matter. Yeah. What are you saying when you're making those excuses about time? I don't matter. This other thing outside of me matters more. And yeah, we've all got our responsibilities. We've all got those things that we have to tend to. But it's just interesting how we always put ourselves last. Mm. Yeah. That, that reminds me of one of the other really amazing takeaways I took from that first time mm. that we met. And it was that self-care is the medicine for low self-worth. Yeah. Because... Myself and a lot of clients that I come across are, are these chronic givers. Mm -hmm. And if it is coming from a place where you don't really believe that your worth is high enough for you to not do that, I, 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 I see a common pattern in people where there is low self-worth and the giving, like you said before, the trying to help others might have maybe helped you. The giving because you really you're really hoping to receive, but you mm -hmm. don't know how to do it mm -hmm. for yourself, but you'll do it for everybody else. You'll do it until you're a puff of dust and then wonder yeah. why are people not giving back? Why yeah. am I always checking in on people? Why, why, why am I not being met with the effort that I put out? And to me, it seemed like a really simple antidote. Okay, I don't even really have to think about it, but if I'm doing self-care every morning, I am telling myself that I'm worthy of that. And so before I even consciously know what's going on, I'm fuller. I can assert my boundaries without feeling like I'm on the porch with a shotgun, like, get back. This is my space. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't have to be ferocious about. Because I think when, you, when you've given everything away and you think, okay, I've given, I've given, I've given, I've given, I've got this tiny patch over here and then someone wants to come and, oh, can I sit on this patch with you? You give. So obviously you're okay with that and you're there like, okay, fine, take my patch because you don't know how to tell the world to love yeah. you differently. Yeah. That, that has been profound for people that I've been working with that fully identify that there is low self-worth, but to just think about it or to just give themselves affirmations or some of these other methods that they might have heard about how to rebuild that self-love and self-worth, it just seems like it doesn't stick. But by actually dedicating time every day for self-care, it doesn't even have to be a specific thing. That was the other thing I got from you. I just gave myself time. And then on the day, I'd say, okay, what do I need today? I've carved out this time. No one can touch it. It's mine. What do I need? That that's actually how you mend that or bring the level up of that self-worth. And then it just shows up. You don't even realize that the self-worth has been topped up until you notice some of your behaviors or some of the ways that you're speaking to other mm. people. The language starts to change because yeah. the body starts to change and you find yourself using different words, words you never used before. Like, no, I don't think I'll come to that thing tonight. I think I'm just going to stay in. I, I feel like just having a night to myself. You know, what the hell? Where did that come from? Yeah. You yeah. always want to do things. How come you're saying no? Yeah. And pe people do get... <laughs> People do, if you've, been an, if you've been a chronic giver and then all of a sudden you don't give, that can be jarring to watch the reactions in the people in your world that are used to you giving because you've enabled them to take. 
yeah. by you saying, here, have my patch, you're telling them, I'm fine to give that away. I'm okay with you having my patch. But inside, you're desperately hoping that they'll get it without you having to say, please don't take my patch. Mm. So it's really tricky. Isn't it? And so why do we find it so difficult to say no? I like saying no. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> we it's, don't want it's, to be rejected. It's actually, yeah, it's actually saying yes to yourself. But, you know, we don't want to let others down. And by saying no, actually what it does is it highlights you're seen in that moment. You're seen as someone who has needs and you're meeting them. And that immediately opens you up to judgment. Oh, you're now Karina that has needs. Oh, so selfish. <laughs> yeah. This idea of selfishness is a very interesting one. Hmm. Mm. Because we're taught, we're taught to give with, with no regard for self. And that being some sort of noble mission or quest. And to actually look after yourself has always been deemed in our society to be rather selfish. Yeah. You know, one of the highest, one of the highest forms of, of human interaction is the act of service. But it depends where you're doing it from. Are you doing it from a place of lack where you don't feel good enough? So you feel like if you do this thing for that person, they'll like you more or that they'll do that thing for you or that you'll be friends or that whatever. Or like we said at the start, okay? are you doing it now from a conscious choice that yes, I will do this for you because I've made a conscious decision? Mm. And I've checked in and I'm good and I'm full of energy and no problem. I will help you move your house today. Mm. So which one's more selfish? Well, I think if you're doing things out of obligation, but inside there's a real discord and you have resentment. Yeah. Who is that a service to? It's exactly. a complete disservice to self. Exactly. And it's not helping the other person because you just end up getting really, really bitter and resentful at them. I think you also said once, uh, having boundaries teaches the world. By having boundaries, you tell the world how to love you. Yeah. Did you say that? Yeah. And by having boundaries, you train the world on how to treat you. Mm. It's, it's the line that cannot be crossed. It cannot be stepped. It's like that non-negotiable spot where if you step there, you will find me there every single time with a sign, hello, <laughs> hello, <laughs> how are you going? How can I help? Mm. Am I taking a few steps back? Mm -hmm. Oh, hello. Yeah. That's hardest to do in intimate relationships. The crossing of boundaries, the overstepping of lines, that not being able to keep a sense of self in relationship in accordance with the other. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really, really difficult to do. And that's where the, you know, pouring some, some time into your practice, the study of the self. Gives you a sense that you are actually in this world. And then, you know, you pour that into the relationship. Two independent people pouring their learning into the relationship. As a team with healthy boundaries. Mm. Yeah. When I work with a lot of couples, that's that's the thing I find the most, Karina, is 
the the boundaries are just so blurry and the overstepping and the and the the unawareness of those traumas and the playing out of those old stories. He did this, he did this, she did that, he did this. Well, hang on a minute. If we come back to you, like you said before, and we have a look at your line, how are you showing? Mm. How are mm. you showing her how to love you? Mm. What are you actually doing here? Yeah. Magic, working with couples, magic. I'm not even sure how we got onto that, but mm. boundaries. Well, it, there's something to be said for in the beginning of a relationship of any kind, work, intimate, friendship. Maybe family is different because you, you're there from the beginning. But if you set that boundary line where you don't really want it and you make concessions from the get-go and you make that boundary line right here <laughs> and you pretend that that's okay and you hope that you'll be able to extend it out over time, I think that that's tricky because these were the initial parameters. Now you want to move that boundary line? Does that mean that everything that happened between here and here ever was you weren't okay with that. Mm. So what you were saying before about really just doing that work on yourself and having, having an outside eye, whether it's a sensei or a therapist or an accountant or whoever it is that holds that space for you. Or a yoga teacher. Or a yoga teacher. Or a Chinese so that you can, practitioner. Or a Chinese medicine practitioner, anybody, <laughs> brother or whoever, dog, maybe not. <laughs> Good listener to help you really notice and pay attention to the stuff that comes up so that you can get clearer on it for yourself. So you can set those boundary lines according to where they really should be, not yeah. where you not where you want to put them to make yeah. someone like you yeah. or to appear to be different than you actually are. Yeah. And to do it in a way that <clears throat> respects everyone. So you're not just, you're not just swinging the sledgehammer. No, no, no. This is it. If you come any closer. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, which is why a lot of people, this is one of the main reasons why people stop doing the work is because they're confronted with this thing. I've changed to a point now, so where people around me are starting to not recognize me and they're getting really uncomfortable. And I know that if I need to keep growing, I'm going to go this way and perhaps these people aren't going to come with me. That's a hell of a decision for a lot of people to make. Yeah? Then we've got to sit with that idea of loss and grief and the unknown and whatever that might bring up. And people leave. They go back. You know, but there's a third option. You know, you can do it really slowly and gently and bring that person along with you. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen so many, I've seen so many partners of my clients change because that person has brought them along really slowly and, and just through osmosis, through indirect training, that person has changed. Mm. it doesn't always work like that sometimes you have to sometimes you know it, the, the the behaviors are too deep or it's toxic or whatever and you need to go but i've seen i've seen many bring their partners along i've had partners write me letters saying you know, I've never met you, but through my partner, actually, I've become the man I've always wanted to be. Mm. Wow. You know, my partner taught me how to see her for the first time.
you know, I, I thought I, I thought I was, but no, I, I really wasn't. I just thought that what I wanted is what she wanted. So I just kept throwing at her what I wanted, thinking that's what she wanted. And the whole time thinking, well, that's what she wants, but she's just getting ignored. I say he, she, it could be the other way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I can see her now and, and, and she's, she's beautiful. Or I, I, you know, I, I, I can see him now and he's, I, you know, I, I, I can see what he's been doing this whole time because I'm, I'm now outside of my trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, where's the time like, gone? I feel like we could. I mean, we do have such long languid interesting mm. conversations i feel like uh <laughs> that's been so wonderful oh my gosh people are just gonna they're gonna get so much out of that i, I, feel I really hope so, so grateful yeah. it's a lot of uh, a lot of me rambling i can I, I hope they make something out of it they will definitely yeah, really make do. more than something out of it yeah, yeah there's so many great nuggets in there mm. for, for anybody listening whether they're pracky or yogi or just someone who <sighs> needed to hear that Mm. Yeah. And, I needed um, to hear that. Did you? Yeah. Oh, everybody wins today. Yeah, I needed. I to needed hear to hear that. that too. Yeah. Like <sighs> you know, great. since I since I always said like it, everything you say is for your own training. You know, mm -hmm. so speak well, and and everything's a reminder. You're only ever talking to yourself. That's it. Especially when you think you're talking to someone else. Especially, you're only ever talking to yourself. So <laughs> so spell spell well. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sol. Oh, you are you are so welcome. This You're so welcome. Great. It was a great. It was a great, great experience. Thank you. Yeah. My first podcast. So there you go. Amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. maiden voyage. Fantastic. Maiden voyage, and it was. Yes. It was lovely to do with some with someone that I have such respect and trust for. So thank you. Mm. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. We'll, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. No, Good you're night. welcome. Good on you. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye now. Bye.